Hey guys, Raven of Ash here. I felt like this was the time for me to share with you guys my thoughts on the Dark Souls 3 invasion system and how it could have been improved. I will also talk a little bit about the PvP balancing in what regards to invasions. I will address all of these issues in topics. However, don't forget that these are just my opinions, and you guys can and probably will have different perspectives about these issues. I'm always interested in hearing what you think. Write your opinions in the comments below and let's get this discussion on the road. Ah, I like to do lengthy videos, so prepare for a long ride. So without further ado, let's get into it. Nothing is so divisive in Dark Souls 3 like the invasion system. Some people love it, some people hate it. The thing is, it's invasions that really make Dark Souls a different game from all the other Souls-like games out there. Just to name a few, Neo does not have invasions, Lords of the Fallen does not have invasions as well, and as far as I know, Code Vein will not have invasions. There is talk about multiplayer in Code Vein, sure, but I would assume that it might be a co-op multiplayer or even dual-like PvP, but not invasions, or at least I've never heard about them, and I've searched, trust me. It's interesting to see that the concept of invasions has not been introduced in almost no video games. Why is that? Well, I think that the concept of invasions is daunting for many players, and especially for new players. I get the sense that most game developers don't want that, because a lot of players probably don't want that. Why introduce a mechanic that can scare people away? Why not make it an optional mechanic? Well, Dark Souls is a game about overcoming obstacles. It's about growing as a player. If invasions were optional, how many people would choose to turn them on? Or if you could lower the PvE difficulty of the game, how many peoples would have done just that? In my opinion, the lack of these options exists by design. It's not some option from software just forgot to add to the game. It's based on the central premise to the gameplay of the Soulsborne franchise that in order for you to experience the highs, you must also experience the lows. Only from hardship will triumph arise. This is because this franchise is not about beating the game. It's about how proud of yourself you are when doing so. Yes, it's about a true sense of pride and accomplishment. So rare in game nowadays. This is because the invasion mechanic is, for the most part, a PvE balancing mechanic. You cannot cheese through this game with co-opers with no trade-offs. You can summon two or three friends and deal with more invaders, or face the world alone and deal with less invaders, or play offline or unnumbered and deal with none. This is because if you want to beat the game, you have to pay the price. That is the Dark Souls experience. It's intrinsic to it. Victory will come, but at a cost. Overcoming that cost will leave you feeling proud of your efforts. It's the Dark Souls equation. From Software is often criticized by us Dark Souls players, but I need to tip my hat to them for sticking with the invasion mechanic, much more than for only creating a beautiful PvE experience. Invasions take guts from a design and sales standpoint. Making beautiful textures and skyboxes does not. Even from a financial standpoint, invasions are risky, because they can scare people away. The ones that like to invade would buy Dark Souls anyway, if only for the PvE, so this mechanic might make From Software less money on the long run, or at least risk doing so. This is especially true because the game industry has changed so much in these last few years. Nowadays you just go to an online store and buy a game in under one minute. Easy to buy, easy to play, easy to win, defines a lot of modern video games. Publishers and developers at large want you to swap games fast, not before dropping big sums of money on games through microtransactions and loot boxes. They want games that make you feel instantly powerful, through playing to win in some cases. All is easy, all is well, then on to the next game. This has a big adherence to reality from a business standpoint. It seems to be what most people want. If you look at the Steam chart data, Dark Souls 3 had a peak of more than 129,000 players at launch on the 31st of March 2016. Less than one month later, only a bit more than 78,000 players were playing the game. One month later, at May 30, 2016, only 18,000 players were playing the game. This means that two months after launch, only 14% of players relatively to the peak numbers were playing the game. The hype train had moved on. Most games behave similarly. From other perspective, if we look at the PS4 trophies, only 36% of people got an Estus to plus 10, and only 30.4% got a link to the first flame ending. This means that a large majority of people didn't even beat the game before moving on. More impressive is the following statistic. Udex Gundir kills amounted to 89.2%, and Lightning and Bonfire for the first time amounted to 96.4%. This means that a full 7.2% of people that lit that first bonfire never beat Udex Gunder. That's impressive. 
My conclusion is that players, at large, don't want to learn about their games in any depth. They prefer to buy other games, and that's okay. From Software, however, stuck to its vision about the PvE difficulty and the invasion mechanic, although making it much harder for the invader to succeed in Dark Souls 3 than in previous games of the series. Also, unwillingly or not, it created an endgame much better for PvP through invasions than it did for PvE. I will discuss this aspect later on. Is a mechanic that does not exist in other games inherently flawed? No. It means that people like different things. Sometimes even the same person likes different things at different times. Diversity is a good thing, not a bad one. I, for one, don't want to play 20 games with exact the same mechanics. And besides, not every game needs or should appeal to the same audience. I believe that a game that appeals to all is special to none. I don't look for one more video game, I look for special video games. Games that I will remember playing in 10 or 20 years time. For me, these are the games that matter. This is because for a long time gamers such as myself that has played video games for very long, I feel that the unpredictability and tension of the invasion mechanic is sorely lacking in most games. Truth is, video games are becoming stale for me. I've played it all, shooters, MMOs, strategy games, etc. Games have become predictable inside their own specific genres. You always know what to expect. Play enough video games and the word jaded comes to mind. Invading or being invaded, however, is for me a fresh and unexpected experience. It's tense, it's stressing. It's an experience that can be exhilarating or rage-inducing. In the end, it steers emotions, and for me, that's why I play video games. Another discussion that is frequent when discussing the topic of invasions is the following. Is dying to an invader different to dying to the PvE? Yes, I believe it is very different for most people, and it's different for me as well. That's why a lot of people don't play PvP games. Even in PvP-centric games like For Honor, which is built mainly on 1v1 PvP scenarios. Just browsing through the For Honor trophies on PS4, we can see that only 43.7% of players have won a single duel, and only 13.5% have won 20 duels. Ok, but how about the Dominion game mode? 55.4% has won a single Dominion match and 22.9% has won 20 Dominion matches. This data also means that in all likelihood many, many people didn't even play For Honor against human players, ever, on the PS4. People just don't want to be beaten by other players in life or in a video game, or are not willing for whichever reason to put in the effort to become better. I understand that, and it's ok. However, it's not because I don't like a mechanic, or I don't agree with it, that I would prevent others from enjoying it. I would buy a different game in that case, because that game does not suit me, and that's also ok. The invasion mechanic, however, is especially contentious, because that's not what a lot, if not most of the people signed up for. Yeah, that's right, most people didn't sign up for invasions. The thing is, Dark Souls 3 is advertised as a mainly PvE experience. If you go to the Bandai Namco site, they put the big emphasis on the PvE and they say about the PvP the following. Evolution of trademark online multiplayer functionality that seamlessly integrates online interactions into single player story. Hell, this is the most laconic and euphemistic way of talking about co-op and invasions that I've ever read. It's almost like the higher ups said, um, don't play the invasion thingy. It can be in the game, but don't need to scare people away. The game boxes don't even make a mention to that. It reads, as fire fades and the world falls into ruin, journey into a universe filled with more colossal enemies and environments. Delve into a world of epic atmosphere and darkness, through the series' hallmark gameplay and rewarding gameplay and immersive graphics. Now only embers remain. But even if you read some reviews, there is nothing about invasions. In this GameStop review from April 4th, 2016, there is not a mention to invasions in the game. In IGN's review from the same date, there is also no mention made to invasions. They were done soon after launch, so maybe the reviewers didn't get invaded, or they played offline, or they had copies before the game was launched. But if I was buying the game and had never played the Soulsborne franchise, I would never know this mechanic existed. Other than being warned about NPC invaders on the IGN review. And of course, you can say that if you are not timbered, you cannot be invaded. This is true. Or if you don't summon phantoms, the likelihood of being invaded diminishes. This is all true. But most people don't know that, at least in the beginning. In my first playthrough, I was always embered without knowing what it meant, other than having a greater HP bar. Of course, the ember tooltip tells me something about that. But there are so many items that I didn't read the descriptions of them all. The thing is, in my opinion, invasions are hated by some because a lot of people don't understand the mechanic and most were not even aware of it before playing the game. 
Most people never invaded nor they wish to. Most people buy Dark Souls thinking they will get a PvE experience and get sucked into a hybrid one. So although I believe that invasions should be in the game and impossible to turn off, I also think they should be advertised, especially by From Software and the Specialized Press. Now, are invasions hard in Dark Souls 3? I answer with a resounding yes. If you don't know the game, or if you are not a Souls veteran with PvP experience, the R1 mashing that works wonders in PvE will get you to an early grave, especially at higher soul levels, faster than it takes to say, oh shit. How to parry, how to backstab the poise mechanic, knowing the weapons that you are facing, learning the levels where you invade by heart, optimizing your build and so many other skills all take time and dedication, and perseverance by failing time and time again. And still on March 2018, most invaders are not very good. Just do a dry finger run or play in a world where a dry finger is activated and see invaders dying in droves. This does not mean, of course, that all invaders are bad. Just go to St. Riot's stream and you'll see the cream of the crop of invaders. But those guys are an elite and an exception, not a norm. The truth is that you need to persevere in order to win invasions consistently. You need to learn the game in depth and still the best invaders lose from time to time. This is what keeps veteran invaders playing, the thrill of the fight, win or lose. Something that can never be truly conquered because every invasion is a different experience and sometimes an unwinnable one. That's why you should never feel bad for losing an invasion. Especially using the respec glitch or save files, there are so many ways to play invasions. Winning is not everything for most veteran invaders. Improving and experimenting can be the end goal for many. Trying out new builds and playstyles is an exhilarating experience. Everything is viable in invasions to some degree. Will you win less if you invade with only a spear at meta levels than with a kitted out dark build? Yes, but it is a challenge, and some people enjoy PvP challenges, same as some people enjoy PvE challenges. This is because overcoming those challenges is fun. The thing is, I love the invasion mechanic in this game, even relatively to other Soulsborne games. This game makes invasions to be more strategically driven than in other games of the saga in my opinion. The fact that the game has so many disadvantages to the invader makes the invader need to play strategically and not just blindly engage a party of three. That may work if you are skilled in playing at lower levels, but at high soul level invasions, even the best have a lot of trouble engaging a party of three in a neutral situation without mobs. The strategic component of invasions is compounded by the fact that matchmaking prioritizes worlds with multiple players. Invasions in Dark Souls 3 are not supposed to consistently be 1v1s, and that is why I love them, or else I would go dueling. The verticality, the traps, the builds, the mind games, good old 1v1 PvP techniques, and much more comes into play, and I feel the amount of variables to be entertaining. Everything comes into play, it's a shifting puzzle that can sometimes be won in several ways, and sometimes by none. However, the fact that I love the invasion mechanic and that I'm overwhelmingly in agreement with its rules does not mean I think that the system is perfect. A lot of topics were brought up in the community throughout the months regarding the game's invasion mechanic as a subset of its PvP ecosystem. I will now give you my thoughts on them dividing these issues and topics. Since the game launched, some people always complained about the very low stamina cost of rolls. This makes evading attacks all too easy, and roll spamming became a big issue, forcing invaders to be the masters of roll catch. A lot of people believe that the stamina cost of consecutive rolls should have been increased. However, the stamina cost of rolls is one of the hardest mechanics to tune, as they have to be right for PvE, duels and invasions, and can fundamentally change the way the game should be played. And that's my problem with fixing rolls from an invader standpoint. When you are being chased down by multiple opponents, you will need every roll you can get in order for not to be hit by several weapons at once and stun locked to death. Increasing the stamina of rolls would make life harder or impossible when fighting in several scenarios where multiple opponents are trying to kill you. Some people say that making rolls so cheap makes killing someone very quickly very hard. This is true, but what's the rush? Instead of killing your opponent in 15 seconds, it might take you 2 or 3 minutes. Is that so awful? Oh, but cheap rolling makes survival until the host resummons easier. True. But in my opinion, that's the problem of the resummoning mechanic, not the cheapness of rolls. I will discuss this issue a little bit later on. So, because invasions in Dark Souls 3 are centered around the invader fighting multiple opponents, I would not touch the stamina requirements of rolls. 
A lot of people have a similar opinion about Estes healing. Because healing is so fast in this game, it's very hard to punish. An endless chugging from hosts and phantoms becomes a thing. For me the issue is similar to roles. Healing needs to be balanced for vastly different situations, ranging from PvE to invasions. And slow healing would greatly change the dynamics of PvP as well as PvE. Rebalancing these two mechanics would be akin to playing a different game, and probably that's why FromSoft never touched these mechanics since launch. Against a party of three, if healing was easily punished, the invader would be at an even greater disadvantage, and balance must be seen from that perspective as well. The disadvantages of slow healing and invasions for the invader would be tremendous, as an opposing phantom could retreat to slowly heal while the rest would be pressuring the invader. The invader, on the other hand, would have no respite. Sure, invasions would end quicker if no one could heal fast or roll a lot. The trade-off would be that invasions would end much quicker for the invader as well, win or lose, and would result, I would bet, in the invader losing much more. The role and Estes mechanics ensure survivability and slow burn invasions. If an invader is higher skilled than the opposing party, survivability over time will give the invader more opportunities to risk plays, screw up and still come back for the win. Survivability also leads to a less passive playstyle that I believe should be encouraged. This is vastly different from duels, where a very reactive playstyle is encouraged because you cannot heal. And for me duels are boring exactly because of that. No mistakes can be risked. So exploration comes always at the risk of a fast defeat. So, like rolls, I think that the fast Estes healing should not be touched in this invasion ecosystem. Given the amount of disadvantages that the invader has relatively to the opposing party, invaders have become over-reliant on burst damage. This is true, as the parry into Hornet Ring Repost is one of the few ways to quickly get rid of phantoms. Nowadays I feel like the only unbalanced one-shot mechanics are the ones on some elemental infusion setups, especially the Chaos Dagger Hardnet Ring combo. This said, even nowadays a well-made host build will survive even a Chaos Dagger Repost in most scenarios. I am not against phantoms being one shot, as a lot of invasions would be very hard to win without that gimmick. Don't forget, however, that a repost requires a parry, that if fail has big costs to the invader as the opposing party can gang up on him, especially at high soul levels, and because whiffing a parry causes a big stamina loss. It's a high risk, high reward option to the invader, so there is skill in getting parries consistently against several opponents. Also, don't forget that the invader can also be one shot same as friendly phantoms as it has the same unnumbered HP than friendly phantoms to the host do. So in my opinion, in the invasion ecosystem of Dark Souls 3 only the higher damage one shot option should be toned down a little bit. Since the poise patch, I believe a sweet spot was reached with the poise mechanic. The poise mechanic, albeit a complex one, works very well in my opinion. The idea that fast weapons cannot interrupt heavy weapons such as Ultras, if certain armor poise thresholds specific to each hyper armor weapon class are reached, makes a lot of sense. Conversely, small weapons will always be interrupted no matter how much armor you stack. So nowadays I feel that the poise mechanic works very well, and that from software made a good work rebalancing it. This topic is tied with the evolution of the game since launch. At launch, quality builds reign supreme, with some good decks and strength builds that were effective as well. Quality was especially good because at the meta soul level you could go 40 strength and 40 decks and you could use almost all weapons in the game at good and sometimes optimal damage levels. The quality build was both very strong in duels as well as in invasions. However, elemental infusions did less damage than their physical counterparts. But doing chip damage through shields, as shields were designed to be really good against physical damage, but not so much against elemental damage. Bleed Infusion was kinda useless, because the Carthage Rouge buff was very strong, and a weapon with innate bleeding such as a Onikiri and Ubadashi buffed with Carthage Rouge could proc bleed in very few hits. By using a bleed gem, you would not proc bleed much faster than with Carthage Rouge, but you would lose a lot of physical damage, so they were seldom used. Because Poison always did very little damage in this game, the relative importance of Poison Infusions and the Rotten Resin buff was always relatively small in the game's PvP ecosystem, both before and after the infusion patches. However, after the 23rd of March 2017, several patches changed the infusion system quite a bit. Cartus Rouge was nerfed badly, which is something I don't disagree relatively to some weapons, but it made other weapons very weak, such as the Fist and Claw weapons that had innate bleed properties. The rebalancing of Cartus Rouge should, in my opinion, have been made with specific weapons in mind and not as a blanket nerf.
Bleed gems were buffed in order to account for the nerf of Cartus Rouge. So now you could only have a strong bleed buildup or damage, not both. This led to the disappearance of almost all bleed builds from the PvP ecosystem, because their damage was very low and the bleed proc could be rolled out. This was always the case, but the bleed proc was something that happened on top of the damage, now the bleed proc was almost all of the damage. This indirectly affected luck builds as well. These builds used luck and hollow gems to increase the bleed proc. Because hollow gems never gave a very good damage scaling, those builds also disappeared because of the Cartage Rouge nerf. For example, the Feared Luck Warden Twin Blades Hollow build buffed with Cartage Rouge was all but extinct. It's very hard to see that weapon being used in invasions nowadays. These changes affected build and weapon diversity, which is something that I feel made the PvP ecosystem poorer. But From Software did more than that. They buffed elemental infusions. This led to a big change in the ecosystem that, in my opinion, was for the worst. Elemental infusions are, simply put, better than physical builds in almost all scenarios, in almost at all soul levels, as they do more damage than their physical counterparts. There was no trade-off, they were just better. From all the elemental builds, the one that became the strongest was the dark build with the Chaos Dagger, because of how resistances to elemental damage are calculated. But is it just the damage that it's better? No. At meta level, a dark build can also benefit from Tears of Denial, the best PvP spell, and the Sacred Chime of Filionor, which is the best passive regen item in the game. Also, and unlike physical builds, elemental builds can ship through shields, making them quite weaker. Besides this, dark builds at meta level, or even a bit below, can use almost all weapons in the game that can be infused. Some heavy decks and strength weapons are the exception. Also, this makes all the non-infusible weapons weaker in comparison, and those weapons are some of the coolest in the game. Think of all the boss weapons, if you want to play with them, you are at the relative disadvantages versus a dark build. This infusion system leads to less build diversity and less weapon diversity, and that translates to more boring invasions as people drift to fewer weapons. And for me, the PvP ecosystem has become poorer. So you beat the game, great. Now let's go to NG+. Why? Well, not really any reason for the overwhelming majority of people. All the enemies are the same and they are located in the same places. They just do more damage, have more HP and drop more souls. The biggest reward, especially for PvPers, were the plus 1 and plus 2 rings. Guess what? The Ring City DLC comes out and all the best PvP rings are available in the Ringed City at plus 3. Only the Sage Ring plus 3 and the Lingering Dragon Crest Ring does not have a plus 3 counterpart. Yeah, that's it. The decision of not making NG cycles interesting in the least might be for me the worst design decision from software made in this game. It makes PvE much more boring as all playthroughs are basically the same. Higher NG cycles could even be more interesting than NG cycles as you can now have all the stats to play with all the builds in the game. But there is just no incentive. This also leads to less high level invasions, and no more invading with a single build in all the zones of the game like we used to do with soul level 125 builds. This would always happen because less people are playing the game as time passes, but this effect could have been softened by doing interesting higher NG cycles. But what incentives could there be? For starters, enemy positioning and number. One of the greatest feelings in From Software games is not knowing where your PvE mobs would appear on your first playthrough. Now imagine doing that in 3 or 4 NG cycles. It would be like playing 3 or 4 different Dark Souls 3 games. This alone would make people play higher NG cycles and Dark Souls 3 a much better game. Also, why couldn't there be one or two different weapons per higher NG cycle? Yes, there's the Twin Prince's Greatsword, and that's good, but why not make more of these weapons? They could be slightly underpowered as well, or just cosmetically different from other weapons in the game. Same thing goes for armor. Why can't there be some new armor in higher NG cycles? Cosmetic items do a big difference to gamers, and I believe people, or at least some people, would play higher NG cycles for these rewards. I know I would. From Software was lazy with the higher game cycles design, and that is something I hope they fix with the Shadows Die Twice game. Yeah, they stepped on the gas a little bit with these weapons. A lot of them are the strongest weapons in their respective classes, and that's a bit unbalanced. Like the plus 3 rings, I believe it was to lure players back into the game and make them buy the DLC.
as well as admitting their NG plus cycles were very badly done. Examples of these very strong weapons are the split leaf and the crucifix, arguably the best and second best halberds in the game, and a few of the best weapons in the game for invasions, period. Other examples are the Herald Curved Sword, which is comparable to the Murakumo but has a better weapon art, whose upper armor starts fast and does a lot of damage. Or the Ringed Knight Spear, which is arguably the best spear in the game, in its 800 plus true combo, and I could go on. So maybe a slight nerf to these weapons, or a slight buff to the older weapons would not have been a bad idea. Yes, I know, I know, you could do a respect glitch or use save files, yes, but those methods are a run around to a bit of an idiotic system of limiting respects. The system exists, in my opinion, in order for you not to be always at Rosario respecting, when you want to beat a certain boss. I understand that, but why can't I, after I beat the last mandatory boss, respect how many times I want, either for dueling or for invading? Forcing players to do a playthrough in order to try different builds, especially for PvP, does not make a lot of sense to me. However, the possibility to respec at all was a good step taken in Dark Souls 3 relatively to Bloodborne or Dark Souls 1. Dark Souls 3 was clearly designed to cater to a more casual audience, and nowhere this shows more than the password system and how unbalanced it can be for PvE, but more importantly for PvP, namely invasions. From Software wanted people to play together, and so allowed people from any level to co-op via password matchmaking. Yes, a Soul Level 15 host of Embers can summon a Soul Level 600 friend, or tree for that matter, and although his damage will be nerfed, he will still have the same attunement as a Soul Level 600. He will still have the same vitality as a Soul Level 600, so he can wear the heaviest armor in the game. Also, he will be able to use any weapon in the game because he will have the stats for it, and he will still do a lot of damage, even if nerfed, and he can also have their full Estus at plus 10, yes, at high wall of Lodric. Now try invading that host at soul level 15, and your odds against those dudes are unfair, to say the least, even if you are twinked to the hilt. If the whole point of invasion is to balance the game, overlevel phantoms need to be made much weaker for their nerfing their damage and absorption and or allowing max co-op ranges, for example up to soul level 125 or so, where people still have to make trade-offs in their builds. The issue of password summon ties into another issue which is the resummon of fallen phantoms. After the 12th of April 2017, From Software introduced a cooldown to the resummoning of friendly phantoms to the host of about 30 seconds, which is clearly little time because of the roll spam or just running away. A lot of times after I kill one phantom, the host just runs away to resummon while other phantom stalls me. When I kill that phantom, the other phantom is already summoned and they can wait safely for the summoning sign of the phantom I just killed to reappear, rinse and repeat. So a cooldown of, for example, 3 minutes or so would make much more sense. Is waiting 3 minutes to resummon a phantom that unreasonable? I don't think so. Would it prevent co-op? I don't think so. Anyway, that 30 second resummon cooldown does not apply to password summons, and this is completely idiotic, as password summons can be overleveled phantoms with all the advantages that entails, and they can coordinate through comms. This might be a bug though, as I don't believe from Swafter wanted this issue to exist. However, this has never been fixed, so I really don't know if this was intended. Nevertheless, the infinite summon mechanic seems to contradict the whole theme of the game. All the game is based on trade-offs. There is the trade-off of being more prone to getting invading, but resummoning while being invading nullifies that trade-off. There is no cost for summoning or resummoning. Besides, or alternative to the resummon timer, that should be a cost to the host that resummons, like losing a Nastus, in order for the host to think about if he should resummon or not. It becomes a tactical choice, rather than something obvious because it's free. This is a bit akin to the seed nerf. Now the host needs to weigh the pros and cons of using a seed. <laughs> this is so unbalanced it's not even funny. We have all been there. Host does not want to fight the invader and goes through the boss door. Fine, it is his right. However, for some bosses the fight does not start immediately. The boss fight only starts when you see the boss life bar. So the host can just go back and forth, attacking the invader without fear of retaliation, hiding when he wants to heal. There are hosts that do this just to grief invaders, I don't know what else to call this. Of course, an invader can just black crystal out, but guess what, when he invades again, he will fight the same dude because probably a dried finger is active. The solution for this is simple. As soon as the host goes through the fog wall, and even if he does not activate the boss, all invaders are sent home and the world is locked from further invading. Simple. This has never been done, however. 
from the many disadvantages and invader faces in invasions, the fact that you have to allocate your Estus total between Ashen Estus and regular Estus might single-handedly be the greatest responsible for the lack of invader castle builds. A lot of the community says castles are not viable in PvP, but I don't think that's the case at all. Just watch the later castle duels by Ravan619. Pyro, sorceries and clerics can be very strong at PvP. The main issue in invasions for me when it comes to caster builds is resource management and the relative strength of the melee build alternatives. This means it's almost always easier to invade with physical builds over caster builds. This hinders build diversity and thus it is a problem for me. And do not forget that this applies especially to invaders and not to phantoms friendly to the host. This is not only because of the password mechanic allowing a soul level 30 host to summon a soul level 700 phantom with 99 attunement, which makes them make the most of their Ashen Estus, but also because fallen friendly phantoms to the host can be resummoned infinitely when they die, or be resummoned after they black crystal out, or just sent home by the host and resummoned when they get out of blue juice. This is part of the reason why ganks have so many casters and why few invaders are casters themselves. So for invaders, Ashen Estus should not be halved like regular Estus is. Some people in the community have stated that there should be friendly fire between co-opers, like there is between Reds and between Reds and Aldrich Faithfuls or Watchdogs. I think that while that might make sense on a PvP scenario, it would be pretty detrimental on co-opers against the PvE. This would make co-opers tackle the PvE mobs on 1v1s for fear of hurting friendly co-opers and I don't think that that would make co-op as fun as it is now, so I would be against it. If a host wants a challenge, he can do so by summoning his friendly co-opers as mad phantoms and risk friendly fire. I've seen this done first on one of St. Riot's first Dried Finger Run streams, where he came across a balancing problem because of the high level of players in his streams that were participating in the Dried Finger Run. If he summoned white or gold co-opers, Saint and Set co-opers would wreck the invaders and make the game too easy for Saint, because there was no friendly fire. If Saint used Way of the Blue, the random summoned blues would be destroyed by the skilled invaders and replenish the rest as faster and kill Saint easily. So a middle ground was struck when Saint co-opers started being mad phantoms. Now he and the mad phantoms fought against the reds but risk friendly fire. So this is a very cool workaround, but one that only works in a skilled environment in my opinion. I don't care about this that much, as there is no in-game incentive to invade over 30 tokens for each covenant, and a disconnect is a win in my book, but disconnecting hosts are violating a game mechanic without any significant punishment other than being invaded as soon as they reload the game, because the invasion timer counts disconnects as if you haven't been invaded. Actually there is a game mechanic designed to prevent disconnects, the way of the white circlet. The item description reads, online play item, restore the connection to other worlds. Those who engage in unjust deeds when in contact with other worlds will lose their connection to them. Way of White Circlets assume such sin as their own, but are found few and far between. Acting without honor will never be without risk. I have no idea if this mechanic is working. However, from the amount of disconnecting hosts that I keep seeing, this mechanic is not working well enough or the game does not explain the penalty to the host well enough. If a prompt appears saying that penalty points were added once you reloaded the game, maybe people would disconnect less. As Nif pointed out in his latest video about the invasion system, invasions are terribly unbalanced to the invader if you consider dedicated ganks. This is different from a co-op group who just wants to beat the level and reach the boss. This is the whole idea of invasions. To prevent a host of embers to reach the boss from a given area, prioritizing worlds with summons in order to balance the game. Dedicated gangers are other thing. These are often guys that have PvP experience and have previously cleared all of the mobs before activating the dried finger to call invaders and kill them just for the fun of it, and have no interest in reaching the boss door. This itself makes the game unbalanced because the game was designed to protect non-PvP players, namely hosts from PvP savvy players such as invaders. This ties with the broken, overleveled summon system problems I've already discussed. I have no problem fighting a gank, and I cherish that opportunity. However, this creates situations in where invasions are simply unwinnable, even for the best invaders. This could be solved by making the host world adapt to what is happening, allocating more multiplayer slots to invaders. 
It would work by limiting how many times a phantom could be resummoned in a given level. 7 to 10 times would be balanced in my opinion. Then the host could further resummon his friend, but the friendly slot would be allocated for invaders. Another 7 to 10 times, and another slot would be allocated for invaders, and so on. For good faith hosts and phantoms, a phantom dying 7 to 10 times while attempting to beat the level should be enough to beat it. For ganks, however, this would limit their strength by losing friendly phantom slots and making the game progressively harder for them. Ganks would be forced to reload the game more often and clear the mobs more often, which would heavily discourage ganking without hindering the progress of people wanting to go through the level in good faith. The community has long asked for this, however I've always thought that this was not a good idea. Invasions are balanced around the core concept of balancing the PvE gameplay. Allowing invasions after the boss is beaten would make incentives for ganks to be even more prevalent. Unless additional advantages were given to invaders like the ones discussed above, I'm happy that you cannot invade bonfires where the boss has been killed. There were some times in the game's life cycle where you could, using glitches, invade as a mad phantom while the host was fighting the boss. I like the concept, but I agree with From Software for patching the game in order to prevent said invasions, because I think they were in balance in favor of the invader. I think for most hosts going through the game defeating a boss is hard enough, without the presence of an invader. Even if the host has summons, the game balances itself by giving the boss more HP. And if one or two cooperators die, good luck on beating that boss, as the boss health won't go down for the rest of the fight. Additional advantages should be given to the host when being invaded while fighting a boss, like the boss having less HP to account for the invader. From Software might have dabbled with the concept of boss invasions, but they were never in the game, possibly because it would have been a very hard mechanic to balance. This was one of the few advantages given to invaders through the game's life cycle, and was a very well designed one in my opinion. The permanent seed nullified one of the few advantages to the invader the game had, which are the PvE mobs on the host's world. Ganks who just sit near the bonfire. If the invader didn't come to their death box, the seed lasted for 2 or 3 hours, making wind seeded invasions much harder. By limiting the seed's duration to 45 seconds, the seed can be used strategically by the host, and by the invader, that can choose if he wants to run up to the host and fight, lead enemies to the host's party, or just roll around until the seed passes. It opens many strategic possibilities and deepens the mechanic. This was a very good design choice in my opinion. Covenants were very poorly designed in Dark Souls 3 from diverse points of view, in my opinion. You never feel part of something special, it's all basically the same. Kill hosts and you get whichever covenant reward, on to the next invasion. Then you can turn the tokens you want for two covenant specific items. That's it, there's no depth. After 30 covenant items those tokens are absolutely useless. I would have liked to have specific covenant areas, hubs, with different NPCs specific to the covenant. Have covenant rewards akin to what happens on arena duels. For example, you could get 600 tongues to Rosaria and get a gold medal or something like that. Get cosmetic rewards for maxing a covenant, auras, cosmetically different armors or weapons, something. Distinguish covenant members, giving them different abilities after a sufficient number of invasion tokens were won. For example, Spears of the Church could have ritual spear fragments that could be used outside the Spears of the Church battle. Sunbros co-opting could summon once per co-op an NPC to help them. Rosarius could summon once per invasion an NPC to help if against several co-opers, or have a permanent silver cat drink effect, or they could have a whistle to attract friendly mobs, etc. Hosts would also be given different powers when beating an NG cycle. Anyway, there should be an evolution to the invasion mechanic, instead of always being the same. Make us feel proud of belonging to a covenant from Soft. Even if some of these mechanics needed to be balanced, these are what patches are for. This would make invasions less repetitive and less pointless from an RPG point of view. One thing that makes invading a bit of a drag, especially as less hosts are playing the game, is the constant jumping around from bonfire to bonfire in order to find invasions. The embers displaying on the bonfire menu are useful, but they are not very reliable, as you can have invasions when no embers are displayed in the bonfire menu or vice versa. Adding the ember symbols when you sit at the bonfire was a good addition for From Software to the game. 
entered the universal red eye orb. The idea was for the game to search all of the game, similarly to how it does to Blue Sentinels and Dark Moons, and make you invade at the random location. Ideally, you could check the locations where you would like to invade and check others out. Not knowing where to invade could add a sense of surprise and novelty to invasions that is now lacking. Twinking in Dark Souls 3 might be much weaker compared to other Dark Souls games. However, that does not mean that the game is balanced, especially for low level invasions. It's really a bit of a shit show at low soul levels in my opinion. It's really hard to beat the twinked out invader at these levels when he has 7 Estus at plus 10. It's not really fair to the host or reasonable. Being invaded at low level can be a very frustrating experience for many new hosts, and I believe a big part of the hate towards the invasion system stems from hosts being invaded at low levels. Conversely, it's very hard for a non-twink invader to invade at low levels and be greeted by three password summoned overlevel phantoms with full estus and access to all the weapons in the game. This issue is particularly hard to tackle without making a subset of invasion mechanics just for low level invasions, different from the rules from the rest of the game. Like in Bloodborne, where you cannot be invaded under level 30, but I don't like subset invasion mechanics. Limiting the number of resummons and making the resummon timer take more time would help the invader, but the game would continue to be particularly imbalanced for newbie hosts against experienced invaders at low soul levels, especially lone hosts. And yes, when in doubt I believe the invader should be privileged in this case, as he had to beat a lot of the game at low soul levels in order to get the Estus upgraded. This is of small consolation for hosts though. Maybe having larger timers where lone hosts could not be invaded at low soul levels would help to make the imbalances less common. However, I haven't heard any suggestions that would solve this issue in a reasonable manner in my opinion. That's it guys, don't forget to write up your ideas in the comment section as I would like to hear what you think. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time. Raven out.